So welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar. Our, uh, the focus of this presentation is the many rules and regulations regarding slaughtering and labeling livestock products in Vermont. Our presenter today is Randy Quinneville, the Vermont Meat Inspection Program Chief. Randy has been involved with the meat industry for over 30 years, starting at a small local slaughter facility, learning the slaughter and processing trade. In 1985, he moved into the inspection field for the state of Vermont in the Chittenden County area. Um, after nine years, uh, Randy moved to a compliance position covering the areas of the industry not under daily inspection and worked with many farmers and producers to help them understand the requirements for marketing meat and poultry products. We're very fortunate to have Randy with us today and welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I guess uh, we should just Jump right in, huh? Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this is kind of just going to be a pre, uh, an overview of, of the um, the livestock slaughter and the meat label, labeling regulations, and um, there'll be a chance for questions as we go and things like that. So, um, or well, there'll definitely be uh, questions and answers at the end as well. Um, so yeah, getting right into it. Um, you know, we always get the question, what does it mean when a product is inspected and passed at slaughter? Um, so um, what it means is that the slaughter is performed in an, in an inspected facility with a hazard analysis critical control point plan and a sanitary standard operating procedure um, in place. So what happens is an inspector is present for anti-mortem, which is before death, um, to view the normal motor functions of the animals that are submitted for slaughter and to watch the humane handling and driving of the animals from the um, establishment. Once the animal does pass, um, is cleared for slaughter, um, the inspector observes the stunning and, and proper dressing procedures. Inspection of the lymph nodes of the head is usually the first thing that's performed. Um, it's mostly a, more as an indicator if there seems to be something in the lymph nodes, then, um, then that would be something that the inspector would then check that animal a little bit deeper and further um, to try to find that connection. But once the animal is eviscerated, the uh, inspector checks all the major organs, the heart, liver, spleen, lungs, kidneys, the lymph nodes associated with all the major functions of the system. And um, if the carcass inspection is then performed to verify that this sanitary dressing procedures have resulted in a carcass that's not adulterated. Um, once it passes that, the animal then, of course, the establishment then washes the carcass and the animal is placed in the holding cooler to wait further processing or shipment of the carcasses. Um, so basically once they have, they have an inspection legend on the carcasses at that point. Uh, then as far as the processing side of it, um, the, the slaughter, the carcass is further broken down, as you know, into individual cuts, steaks, chops, roasts, etc. And um, there's different inspections for each process, but all of the processes are covered under the HACCP plans. Um, so the inspection oversight is on a daily basis for whatever product is being produced for sale in commerce. And check that the, the establishment is actually monitoring the critical control points and the sanitation, labeling, and record keeping, as it says. Um, so as this disinspection goes forward, I should say that uh, during slaughter inspection, the, the inspector is there for the entire time um, in a processing um, type of establishment. Um, they'll be there on a, on a patrol basis. They might be there first thing in the morning for, for pre-op sanitation or in the middle of the day for labeling or uh, checking cooking temperatures if that's what the, the process involves. So as far as Inspection requirements, the Federal Meat Inspection Act is the law that governs inspection and exemptions for red meat, which are cattle, sheep, swine, and goats, and the regulations further define the act, and those are covered in 9 CFR 300 through 331, and again, that's strictly for red meat. Um, the Poultry Products Inspection Act is the law that governs inspection and exemptions for poultry, and poultry is defined as chickens, turkeys, ducks, Geese, guineas, ratites, which encompass ostrich, emu, and rheas, and squab, which are young pigeons. And, the, and again, the regulations that further define the Poultry Products Inspection Act are covered in 9 CFR 381 through 500. Um, so then you get into the actual um, other regulations that pertain to this. And 416 through 500, they apply to um, 
uh, sanitation, facility requirements, the HACCP regulations, um, listeria regulations for ready to eat products, as well as um, due process. Those the parts 500 is the due process for establishments. Um, you know, having their right to say, okay, well, we're doing this right, or we're not doing this, so we're going to correct it this way. So, and then of course there are other volunteer inspection programs for other species, and actual responsibility for those products do fall with the Food and Drug Administration uh, because they're not covered under the FMIA or the PPIA. Um, so then, so species and inspection requirements, uh, amenable species, of course amenable being required to be inspected, um, livestock, that's defined in 9 CFR 301, um, red meat is cattle, calves, sheep, swine, and goats, poultry is defined as any domesticated bird, um, chickens, turkeys, ducks, grease, guineas, ratites, as I said earlier, and those are defined in 381. As far as non-amenable species, you have exotic species, reindeer, elk, antelope, water buffalo, bison, and yaks. So those are, are not required to be inspected, um, but there is procedures if, if establishments want to have that inspected either for their own um, satisfaction or if they have customers who, who are requiring that. Um, the, the voluntary inspection does come with a fee for services. Um, also, we have rabbits, which are governed by the FDA for interstate commerce, and um, generally in the state, it would be it's it's a memorandum of understanding between the health department and us, where we will um, monitor the approved source as far as the facility where their rabbits are slaughtered and processed, in order for them to be sold into restaurants. Um, and again, there is a voluntary inspection program for those as well. Um, but they are not required to be inspected. And the same with game birds, quail, pheasant, and partridge. And we have the same um, memorandum of understanding with the health department for game birds as well. Um, red meat slaughter possibilities. Um, basically, you have a commercial slaughter, which is required to be able to sell meat. And that is the, the procedure where the inspector is on site for the entire slaughter. Um, there's also a possibility to do custom slaughter. Custom slaughter is usually performed um, for an individual's exclusive use and for his or her non-paying guest employees. And under custom slaughter, there is not an inspector um, there during the entire process. So the um, custom slaughter, again, has to be done in an approved facility. Um, On-farm slaughter, um, that is only allowed for the slaughter of an animal of one's own raising on their own property for the exclusive use, again, in the household of the owner and the non-paying guests and employees. So if you um, look at the 9 CFR regulations, the 416.1 through 416.5, that is, a, is an overview of what is required as far as sound construction, uh, keeping vermin out of the establishment, um, proper plumbing, sewage disposal, that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, as the rules say, all, all products need to be inspected and passed to be sold. And then from there, um, USDA has established um, different exemptions for different operations, realizing that you just can't provide inspectors for every operation. So 9 CFR 303.1, that aligns exemptions from the requirements of inspection for red meat, and 381.10 outlines the exemptions for poultry. So um, again, the exemptions do allow you to raise your own animal slaughter for your own use. Um, and that is actually basically the, the first exemption listed. And the second ex exemption listed is if you have a custom slaughter license and an approved facility, um, you can then slaughter for others. And the animals can come from those people, or you can actually sell a live animal from your farm and then offer um, the slaughter services. The uh, Agency of Agriculture does have a certificate of ownership that all owners will sign, um, stating that they know the animal is not being um, slaughtered under inspection, and, and also notifies them that they are subject to fines if that product is sold. Um, there's also another requirement which has to do with um, mad cow disease, and um, so the, the owner will specify the age of the animal, and there are certain procedures that need to, to 
be taken if the animal is over 30 months. And some of that is basically removing what they call specified risk materials, which is basically where the nerve clusters and stuff where um, BSC prions can actually be. So they basically remove the head, um, which is usually isn't there anyway for uh, for our, our purposes, and um, the vertebrae. So some people will get um, will want T-bone steaks and won't be able to get them. They'll end up being semi-boneless strip steaks um, because of those rules concerning um, mad cow disease or BSE. Randy, can yes. I ask you a, a quick question? Like sure. That comes up. Um, so, what uh, are the requirements for a custom? slaughter facility? Like, can you just give a general overview if, if someone were thinking about um, going that route, they wanted to be slaughtering on their farm, um, what, what, would those, what would a custom slaughter facility look like to right. meet a state approval? Yeah. So realistically, there are, are different height um, requirements depending on the species that you're going to be slaughtering. But other than that, it's um, just basic um, hot and cold running water, um, impervious walls that are impervious to moisture and easily cleanable. Um, it's actually floors, walls, and ceilings. Um, approved equipment, um, basically stuff that's you know no wood um, and stuff that's easily cleanable, and then basically a cooler. And sometimes some operations will be able to do this without a cooler if they're within short distance of, of a, another processing facility where that, ca that carcass can get there in a relatively short amount of time to get it under refrigeration. Um, and then, of course, there's the record keeping requirements of the certificate of ownerships and things like that. But the facility itself um, you know, can be anything from a um, remodeled milk room you know, with a little bit higher ceilings, um, or it could be something that, that you build from scratch um, on the way up. So some of the other things that are associated with that is um, you know, the Agency of Natural Resources is in charge of uh, wastewater and sewage disposal. So you do need to contact them as well if you're planning to do something like this. But if you're actually on a farm and most of the animals that you're slaughtering, or 51% anyway, are coming from your own farm operation, then you are able to observe some farm exemptions. So it's best, again, to contact the Agency of Natural Resources um, for that part of it. And a lot of, I'm sorry. Uh, most of the times, too, you know, the waste um, can, is all compostable. So, so the viscera, um, the wastewater, things like that can be gathered and then um, put into uh, compost piles. So that's, that's one means of getting rid of the, the byproducts and waste. And Randy, the, the other question is if, um, if somebody pre-sells an animal, um, uh, can that a live animal? Can they um, is on farm slaughter allowed in that scenario for someone? You would have to have the custom slaughter license. You would you would have to have the custom slaughter license in the facility. Um, by definition, in and I think we cover this a little bit later um, that. That is that second exemption in the federal rules, and it's also by definition in, in state statute that if you're performing slaughter for someone else's exclusive use, that you don't need inspection, but it does need to be in a licensed facility. All right, great. Thank you. No problem. Um, so yeah, moving on to you know more of the retail red meat exemptions, because a lot of you, that's kind of where you end up. You're not in the slaughter. Thing you're basically a retail outlet and and are selling to the end user. So um, again, no red meat products slaughtered on the farm can be offered for retail sale. It has to be inspected and passed. Um, red meat sold through a CSA must also be inspected and passed. So you can have someone do the slaughter and processing for you. Stuff will be packaged and labeled, and then you can sell it from a freezer or refrigerator from your farm. Um, as we say, retail operations can cut inspected and passed meat and poultry products into smaller portions and repackage. It does require a separate cutting area with hot and cold running water, washable surfaces that are impervious to moisture, 
with acceptable equipment. So this is um, kind of the same requirements as a, as a custom slaughterhouse, but on a smaller scale, basically, because you don't need to have the headroom. Um, generally, when you receive carcasses, you're going to have quarters, um, and those are a lot easier handled. Um, you know, the significance of that retail operation being able to cut is that you could send an animal for inspected slaughter, and then if you have a place set up, you can actually do the, the cutting yourself and offer individual cuts to the, to the, the, um, the end user. So in the same sense as you know, you've got the, um, the general store on the corner that they have you know, groceries, and then they have a small meat cutting area separated from the rest of the store, um, they basically they are starting with inspected and past product, and then, and then cutting it smaller. So that's something that can happen at the farm level if, if you have a space that you can um, set up for retail cutting. Um, cost of the retail license, um, if you're selling only inspected and past fully labeled packaged product is $15 per year, um, and the storage facility can't be in the living portion of your home. And uh, for a small retail operation, $30 per year if you're actually doing the cutting and repackaging of the products. Then it goes up to $60 a year if you're up into the, um, you know, the supermarket type of, of uh, range. So I don't think we have to worry about that from the producers that we're talking to today. Um, so again, the retail licenses are required, and they are actually um, for the location, not the person. So if you want to sell from your farm and at the farmer's market, you would obtain a second retail license. So the only thing that's different really is for the farmer's markets, we do allow you to bring your license with you to offer sales at several markets. So that's the one exception to the licensing for the location. And that's basically because you know farmers markets are one day a week, and we realize you might be in one place on Monday, a different place on Tuesday. So we do allow that um, exemption from the actual retail license for location. And the other is the wholesale license if you um, want to sell to other outlets for resale, and that is a fifty dollar a year. Um, per year license, and you have to keep records of where your product is sold to in case there's ever a problem or a recall issue, um, you can track where that is. So we always recommend that if you're doing some of this stuff, you, that the people who are doing the work for you, that you ask them to lot code your product. Then if there is an issue, um, it's usually going to be with a specific lot, and you won't have to basically recall everything that you've sold for the last six months because you can't which lot. So that's a pretty important um, product control feature that you really should um, try to incorporate and work with your, your plant that's doing your work for you. Um, then we, you know, we'll go on to the poultry exemptions, and, and they differ greatly from the red meat exemptions. Um, most of the small producers doing poultry are util utilizing the less than 1,000 birds slaughtered per year exemption. And that allows the sales from the farm, no regulatory oversight, um, but it must be slaughtered under such sanitary standards that will result in a bird that's not adulterated. Um, so while there's nobody there actually watching you, um, you should try to con look at what the sanitary standards are so that you can produce um, a safe product. Um, so with special labeling, um, as laid out in 6 VSA 204, section 3312B, I know I'm just rattling off numbers, but this, so they all kind of fall into place, um, you can sell at farmers markets and to restaurants. Um, and again, that's laid out there. You can need to have a signed certificate from the restaurant uh, stating that they know the requirement for um, placing um, on the menu um, that that's not inspected product. And that's basically because most consumers do consider that most meat and poultry products have gone through some sort of an inspection program. So it's just basically uh, letting them know so they can make an informed decision. Um, you know, if you get over 1,000 birds a year, um, you can go actually up to 20,000 birds without inspection. But once you go over 1,000, you are required to have an approved facility, which ends up being a two-room slaughter facility, one room for the, um, for the bleed, scald, and pluck. And then they would go through a window or around like a three-quarter wall into a clean room where they'd be finished eviscerating, washed, and chilled, and packaged. Um, and um, it, if you're observing these exemptions, you can't slaughter for others. It's only for your own product that, that you raise yourself. Randy, can you talk a little bit about what the sanitary standards are? Um, um, well, you know, from, from an inspection standpoint, I mean, it does 
basically the same thing as an approved facility. You should have hot and cold running water. You should have washable walls and things like that. But again, there's nobody there um, to basically check on these things. Um, so some people will do this process um, outside, um, you know, using um, you know. Uh, scholars and pluckers that are in good repair um, that is allowable, not the best um, for you know sanitation overall, but it is allowed and, and again, there isn't really a um, a set standards per se in writing us to say everything that you have to have, um, but it's basically the farmer's responsibility to be sure that that product does not get contaminated um, through the actions of slaughtering. Great. Um, so I guess from there, um, you know, if anybody has any questions now, we can we can talk about exemptions and stuff. If not, um, we can uh, move on to labeling and and uh, you know uh, address questions at the end. Um, so um, I'll move on to labeling right now. And so labeling is covered in the federal regulations and under 9 CFR 317. Um, it's a pretty long section of the regulations, and a lot of it won't pertain to um, to most of you if you're doing you know individual single ingredient raw products. Um, when you start adding ingredients and a, a lot of other things come into play, but um, generally the minimum requirements for label is is as for um, a producer that's having a plant do their work for them, um, most producers would like to have their farm name on the on the product label. So at the top of the label, you would have the term "packed for" or "processed for," and then your name and address of your farm, um, including the zip code. And if the if the address of your farm is not in the local phone book, you you are required to put the street address on. Um, if it is in the local phone book, you can get by without an actual street address, but it always helps anyway, so people can find you if they want to come to your farm. Um, the product name does need to be on the finished label, um, but that may be applied by an approved hand stamp. Um, it can also be done by um, a computer printer um, and, a, and a pressure sensitive label. Um, so a lot of times you'll have a generic label with a space that doesn't actually have a product name in it, in it until um, that, pack, that product is packaged. And then any qualifying statements. So when you're talking qualifying statements, you're talking about if you use the term natural, for instance, um, you need a qualifying statement that says what natural means, which is that it's minimally processed and has no artificial ingredients. So that would be considered a qualifying statement. Um, there does need to be an ingredient statement if the product's made from more than one ingredient. For instance, the um, a sausage type product would have, uh, you know, pork. Salt, water, spices, etc. So that does need to be listed on the principal display panel. Uh, the inspection legend with the establishment number has to be there, um, and so that is that's how we identify where the actual product was produced. Even though it has your farm name on it, the number in the inspection legend tells us what establishment actually did the work. So the um, so that would be there. So uh, an important thing to remember is that as a producer, you cannot apply this label at your farm. Um, the, the, the inspected establishment actually is responsible for this label because it is their establishment number that's on it. So while you will still have to have them printed and deliver them, um, you can't actually apply them yourself unless you're at the um, inspected establishment working with them. Um, handling instructions are required, such so as keep refrigerated or keep frozen. A lot of places will do both, um, so that if they may keep it fresh for for a few days and then put it in, into a freezer after, um, you know, if it hasn't sold within a day or two. And that's just for product longevity. Uh, net weight statement is required, um, basically, so the customer knows what they're paying for, um, and that the net weight is the actual weight of the product without the packaging materials. And then finally, the safe handling instructions, which you've all seen, um, and I think we have a slide of it later on, are required for all raw products. So that's the, the minimum requirements for a label. Um, here's an example of a label, um, product name, the qualifying statements. This one happens to be that, that they've actually added a broth solution, so they add that underneath the product name. The ingredients will lay out everything that they use. The handling statement there you see is this is keep refrigerated at 35. Um, 
or freeze, I think it says, or below. Okay. So, um, inspection legend, that's a USDA inspection poultry legend there that is being shown. And the contact you know, information for the company that actually is doing the work or is actually distributing the product. It may be not, not be, may not be the same company that, that is actually distributing that actually prepared it. So again, in the ingredient statement, then you do list all the ingredients in order of predominance. So if you apply for um, a label for a sausage um, a formulation, um, you do have to basically tell us what's in it and what you're using for spices and list them in order of predominance as you go through. Um, normally, you'll have you know the spices are at the end, um, but it all depends on how many how much spices you're using. Um, salt and things like that would generally be higher than the spices, but the combination of spices might change where you would put that. So the other important feature of a label is, is the big A allergens. And this is an FDA rule um, that USDA has adopted as well. Um, and so it lists there wheat, crustaceans, eggs, fish, peanuts, milk, tree nuts, and soybeans. And they must be listed in the ingredient statement and the label shall further state its presence. Um, and the example again contains milk, wheat, gluten, or soy. Um, so and, and basically, the big eights are because lots of people are allergic to to those types of ingredients. So they want to make sure that if people are buying this, that they, they are fully aware of that these products may contain that. And I'm sure you've seen those on a lot of products. Um, some are even that they've been produced in a facility that may also um, process tree nuts or something like that. Um, ingredients do need to be sublisted. For the example, cheddar cheese is, is milk, enzymes, and salt. It would be the same thing for uh, soy sauce. All the ingredients that are involved in that uh, will be sublisted as well. So the term spices covers most spices, and so that you don't have to individually list them. Which is, you know, if you've got a, a secret family recipe that you don't really want to share every ingredient, um, that's where you're able to use the term spices and um, and keep that as as confidential as you can for your for yourself, and um, so again, there's a list of things that have to be listed on the label: so onions, garlic, celery, uh, paprika, turmeric, and saffron. Because they color the product, those need to be listed as well. And then the ground mustard, onion powders, garlic powders are usually a high protein content, so um, those are required to be listed if they're in there as well. Um, this screen basically it does show just an example of what the inspection legends look like. Um, the establishment numbers on there are simply for um, to show for you know how they should appear on the label. Um, pretty self-explanatory, and you can go back through and check those to see what you might need on your label. Um, and as you see, the bottom one that's it for exotic species. I didn't put the federal exotic species on there, um, which is actually a triangle brand. Um, so if you get into those types of products and you're looking for USDA inspection, again, that would be a voluntary program that you would actually have to pay, or the plant would have to pay um, by the hour to have the inspector there to do that that inspection. Randy, can you yes. explain um, the difference in using a State inspected uh, slaughter facility versus a USDA. Why someone might choose one or the other? Sure. Um, basically, what you're looking at is anything that's state inspected um, cannot be shipped across state lines. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense because we are an equal to program. USDA comes and reviews us and says that yes, you are performing in the, in the inspection system is performing in a manner that is at least equal to the federal government. But for some reason, they still don't let us go across state lines with the product. So generally, if, if all of your sales and customers are within the state, then you can use a, a state inspected facility. Um, now, the customers can come and buy state inspected product and take it back home for themselves, but you can't ship it across state lines. So you can't have somebody from Massachusetts call you for your product and then uh, send them a FedEx package with the state inspected meat. Um, so that would be the difference. The federally inspected course can, can be um, shipped to all 50 states and can actually is actually eligible for export as well. So I think that's, that's the basic difference. I mean, both, both the federal and state plants operate in the same manner with HACCP plans in place and that sort of thing. So it just, you know, sometimes um, 
you know, there's no need for federal inspection if everything you're selling is right off the farm, and you and you you know have just enough product to to satisfy the customers that you have. Um, and, and what usually happens too is is when small plants start, um, they also um, it, um, they usually will start under state inspection just because we're a little bit more user friendly than the federal government as far as being able to give advice and and um, guidance as to how the small plants can meet the regulations. And then once they build up their business big enough, then they'll make the transition to federal inspections so that they can expand the markets. And uh, I got an email uh, from Jen Colby at the Grass Farmers Association about a new program that might be starting to allow this reciprocity across state lines? Right, yeah. And um, I'll cover that a little bit um, toward the end, actually. Okay. I have a slide there, and, and we'll go into that a little bit. Um, so right now, we'll just continue on the labeling, and, and that should be coming up shortly. So, um, so this is basically an example of the safe handling instructions that's required to be on the um, the package, and so the printers, everybody in this area generally are pretty well used to that, um, and so so they will they basically have that template for you already set up, so you can add that to your label. So then we get to the point of actually getting uh, an approval for an official label. Um, so when you get into, if you're at a USDA plant and you're not using any special claims, um, you can contact the establishment that's doing your work. And this is this is kind of just kind of a step saver um, and makes it makes approval a little bit easier. Is that if they can give you a layout of their existing labels, um, your printer can just modify that label to replace the establishment name with your farm name, add the pack for, process for, and then it's basically what they call a generic approval. And so you get that sketch made up by your printer, and you want to bring that to the plant and have them look at it, and um, and they can say yes, this looks good. Go ahead. Then you have it printed and deliver your labels to um, to to the plant for when they process your product. Um, as I said earlier, the multi-ingredient products do require a formulation breakdown, and that is kept confidential within the inspection service. Um, so then if you get into um, labels with special claims such as raised without antibiotics, raised without added growth hormones, grass fed, pasture raised, um, you do need to submit a written protocol that substantiates your claims um, with the label sketch so that basically though the anybody reading that protocol can say yes this makes sense, this is how they're doing it and, and this substantiates that claim. Um, so the, the protocol should uh, contain what you do for raising the animals, whether you buy them in from other places, whether they're all raised on your own farm, um, that sort of thing. Excuse me. So the assurances from other producers, if you do buy in animals from the uh, from other places, would need to be included in. And you can kind of have a, like a blank uh, statement that you will have the other producer sign saying that they have been raised. Um, in the same way that your protocol is, it shows the raising. So as part of that protocol package, you should also have an affidavit to be submitted at the time of slaughter. And that basically says that yeah, these animals identified below by these tag numbers were raised in accordance with the protocol for such and such a farm. You bring that with the animals to the plant, and the plant will submit that to the inspector because realistically the inspector doesn't know you from anybody else. So if the plant says we're going to put this label on a certain product, the inspector has to be able to say, okay, yes, this animal was raised this way and it is eligible for that type of labeling. And um, I did put a link on there for USDA's uh, labeling regulations and policies. And there's a lot of good information on there. Um, so you know, you do have to do a little bit of searching, but that will get you to the general place. And the, you can have links for the actual forms to to fill out to submit to Washington, and that sort of thing. Um, if you're working, you know, in a, in a Vermont state plant, um, the sketches all come to the Vermont Meat Inspection Office. They aren't they aren't approved at the plant level. Um, there's Michael Mitchell and myself who do um, most of those approvals. And we follow basically the same standards and protocols that USDA does for standards of identity for certain products, um, and the label claims, and having the um, having the protocol to substantiate the claims. And the sketches you can email them, you can fax them, and some and um, 
uh, the plant themselves that you're working through can take your sketch and submit it to us. So there's there's several different ways to get that label here and get get the ball rolling. And um, again, if you have questions or or you need a label approved, you can send them to um, those addresses, Mike or myself. Um, you can fax them. You can call us with questions, and the printers themselves can also send the sketches directly to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here's where we're talking about the interstate shipment. Um, as you, some of you are familiar with, the 2008 Farm Bill uh, directed FSIS to look at interstate shipment of state inspected product, um, and they just recently issued rules for um, what they call the Title V program. Currently, the inspector program works under what they call the Title III program, which says we have to meet certain standards to be able to to exist. Um, Title V is basically a way that USDA is trying to make it um, so that state plants, state plants, smaller processors, etc., can get into um, the interstate market. Um, unfortunately, those rules are are very cumbersome. Um, they actually um, put more expenses on the on the state program. Um, in having to have their own labs and having to meet actually same as requirements rather than at least equal to. Um, although here in Vermont we are pretty close to being same as, but there's different things that that are allowed in the federal system that are not allowed in the state and vice versa. Um, so Vermont at this time is not pursuing Title V. Um, our feeling here is that if if, a, if an establishment is wants to do this processing for um, interstate trade, um, that they're probably better off to go under um, federal inspection. And the way Vermont meat inspection is set up, we actually have a cross utilization program where we, our state inspectors actually provide federal inspection. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Another reason that doesn't make sense is that it's the same inspectors doing the work in the state plants as it is the federal plants. Um, and we all of our inspectors go through the federal training system. So, so again, some of it doesn't make sense, but that's the, the rules and I'm not really sure um, why it is that, that USDA doesn't want to recognize their own review team um, saying that the states are, are actually operating adequately. Um, so again, at Vermont's not looking at that Title V. And realistically, um, you know, we have one state slaughter plant um, that has chosen that they prefer working under state inspection, mostly just because of the the uh, line of communication is a lot shorter than if you want to try to get an answer out of USDA. And um, they were actually under federal inspection for a time. And uh, when the HACCP rules first came in, they they were getting nowhere asking FSIS questions, so they came back to the state program. Um, so now we have we have a few processors um, that are under state inspection, um, and they are doing pretty limited actual processing and stuff for other people. So they aren't really looking to um, to expand into that. Um, arena of of getting the interstate shipment of the products. So there is definitely, um, you know, it, there has to be um, interest from the consumer groups um, or or the inspected establishments um, for um, Vermont to look at this program. But realistically, what it does, it adds a whole other layer of federal inspection and. Um, Kind of just redoing things over and over and over again, so it doesn't seem like it's the greatest program. But that's kind of where we're at at this point. That's subject to change, but right now we're not pursuing it. And if you want to read the actual final rule, there's a link there. It's about 260 pages for your reading enjoyment. <laughs> and, um, that's kind of where where we sit right now with interstate shipment. Um, so again, here's some links for uh, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture Meat Inspection. Um, we have some some documents up there, some licensing um, documents if you want to to do the wholesale or if you want to do a custom slaughterhouse, whatever. Um, there are some basic guidelines there as far as for construction, 
um, things like that. And then of course we're always um, we always try to be available by phone, email, and uh, but usually it's it's kind of best to call if you're not quite sure which direction you're heading. Um, you know, if we get we get a call, an e if I get an email that says, "Yeah, I want to sell meat," but what do I do? I kind of need to know some details as to what markets you're you're trying to um, capture and that sort of thing. Um, again, there's the FSIS website contact as well. Lots of good information there. Um, the search feature on that website is pretty good. Um, and so, if you want to look at what a HACCP plan is, you type in HACCP. It'll give you all kinds of hits where you can look at what generic plans are. It'll give you as producers an idea of what the actual inspected plant has to go through um, in order to be able to process this product for you, um, as far as sampling, um, you know, and, and addressing any hazards that can go wrong um, with the associated steps that they're doing. And Code of Federal Regulations. There's a link there as well. So you, if you uh, can't stay, can't sleep at night, there's a good uh, um, basis for your if you want to know everything you're afraid to ask about meat inspection. And that's basically what I have for um, for the slides. And I see there are some questions coming in. So if you want to yeah, so start addressing those. Yeah, it looks like um, we definitely have some more questions about labeling. One was um, if there is a requirement for nutrition labeling on meat products. Okay. Um, so with nutrition information, they do um, require that on all, all food products except that they've established um, exemptions and those are listed in, in the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I think it's um, 317,400 or something along those lines. But basically, if you're doing less than $100,000 worth of product per year, um, you are not required to do nutrition labeling. Um, and then uh, Lada was wanting to uh, wanting some clarity on on the protocols, and those are only needed if uh, the if you're having some special uh, claims on your label. Yes, you that's you don't need those protocols. Yes, that's correct. So if you're only if you're making a, a husbandry claim, um, you know, if you're grass fed, um, things like that, um, then you would need to to basically substantiate those claims. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so then also, Lana, it looks like she was asking about that they can't be labeled antibiotic free or hormone free. Uh, but rather raised without antibiotics or raised without added hormones, and and this is correct. So, in, in, interestingly enough, I mean, an animal can't be hormone free. So then you have to say raised without added hormones, um, just to be clear. And there are certain species that say hormones are not are not allowed, um, such as in pork. Um, so if you make a statement like raised without added hormones, you also need a qualifying statement to say that. Um, FDA does not allow the use of hormones in pork products. So while you can make that statement to show that, yeah, this is the way we raise animals, you also have to qualify that, yeah, but it's not allowed anyway. Makes sense. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, got, it's kind of a truth in marketing sort of thing, you know. Right. Um, I, another question that I know comes up uh, frequently is if someone does sell a, uh, an animal on the hoof to a customer, um, can they transport it to a custom slaughtering facility for them? Um, yes. Yes, we we don't have any rules at all um, concerning that. Um, there is one rule in, in um, Vermont statutes that allow a producer to sell an animal by hanging weight if they if it's slaughtered under inspection. And in that rule, it does say that you are to relinquish control of the product at the time that you get the hanging weight and make that sale. So in other words, you don't need a license. Um, so if I raise a cow and, and um, I'm selling it to two different people aside to each person, I would have it slaughtered under inspection and then tell the people, okay, each side weighed 250 pounds. The cost is 
you know, dollar eighty-five a pound, and then they pay me, and then I get out of it. And they tell the plant how they want to get it cut up, or they pick it up and bring it to another place and have, you know, someone that they, um, some other establishment that they know that cuts and, and they like the way they do it, whatever for whatever reason, they are allowed to basically either have it done there or take it to another place. So, so the regulations do state that. Although, you know, in these days, a lot of people will say, "Yeah, this this guy's going up for me. I'm going to hire him to to pick up my product for me," sort of thing. So, you know, that's kind of and the rule is written. Um, but again, uh, you know, if somebody's going right by the place. We don't get too worked up if they pick it up for you, kind of thing. And that would that would be slaughtered at an inspected, not a custom slaughter. Yes, that's correct. So, but yeah, so I didn't don't mean to confuse that. They yeah, they still could, you know, theoretically, you know, truck a live animal to an inspected or a custom slaughter facility, um, and then you know, truck it to a different cutter or whatever for them. It's not a big issue there. Okay. So the key is to sell it by hanging weight. Um, yes, if you're if you haven't sold it as a live animal, it, it gives you the opportunity to sell by a hanging weight so that you actually know. Um, you know, you're not, you know, giving yourself, you know, giving your meat away um, <laughs> because you expected it to weigh one thing and then it, it weighed more or less. Um, so, but so if you don't sell it as a live animal, there is that option as well to be able to sell it by hanging weight and and not have actually any licensing. But again, with the retail licensing, you're allowed to sell individual pieces, parts, cuts, sides, quarters, whatever. Are there any other questions out there? Now would be the time to, to pepper Randy here with uh, anything regarding specific markets that you might be interested in or um, selling to or specific species, uh, slaughter questions. Um, he is the, the man in the know <laughs> for sure. I do recognize uh, the names of some people that are here that, that we have been in contact with and, and a couple of people that I've got on my list to call back. So, <laughs> so that's a good thing. And, um, and as always, um, you know, if you have questions, feel free to give us a call. I know these regulations um, can be quite daunting sometimes. Um, so hopefully we can help you understand them and, and make them a little clearer than, what they are, than how they are actually written in the, in the codes. We had a question pop up about the Grand Isle Slaughterhouse and whether that would be reopening. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, the last that we've heard is that um, the people who own that, some of the, of course, some of the, um, some of the personnel have have been um, taken out of that business. Um, the remaining owners are are looking at the possibility of reopening that um, they have met all the requirements for USDA in order to be able to be open, or most of them. And part of that is um, is that they meet all the state requirements as well. And so just the last that I've heard on that is there are some issues with an Act 250 permit. So um, they're working on trying to get those things straightened out. And then the, there is the possibility that it will will reopen. Again, we don't have a time frame on that or anything, but it's, they are working on hopefully being able to open up and offer the services there. As we all know that uh, in the fall, um, there's definitely not enough places to to service everybody that needs it in that time of year. I would recommend for any new processors um, then um, that you want to start looking at places to do your work and plan ahead. Um, if you know that your animal is going to be up to, to um, slaughter weight, you know, in in you know 12 months, you want to be um, looking for um, a place to have them done. So, um, so I see Londa is asking too that yeah, so it's an Act 250 permit um, for I guess there was some the expansion of that plant and whether they followed all the Act 250 permit requirements. Um, so I do see some uh, some more questions coming in. So how can you make your sausage to sell the co-ops 
and how would you label it? So there's a couple of other ways of ways to do that. One is is to have the inspected plant, um, you know, do the processing for you. Um, you would submit your label, your formulation. Um, to the plant or the plant you may have the plant use use a sausage mix that you already like, um, and so that would be they would then you would get the sausage back, um, basically packaged, labeled, and ready to go. Um, the second option is is that retail store option that we talked about, um, in that if you have a place um, that you can have hot and cold running water and, and set up an actual meat cutting area. Um, which we could come and check out or give advice on on getting set up, um, then you could conceivably take the inspected and passed product and make the sausage yourself and sell it um, to individuals. But if you want to sell the co-ops, it would definitely have to be done under inspection. So you could either you know establish a processing facility with inspection of your own um, or have the inspected plants do that work for you. And then, of course, then you would need the the wholesale distributor's license. Could could someone do that in a commercial kitchen, or that that doesn't include the inspection? They would. Uh, um, right, exactly. Commercial kitchens do are not set up to be able to do that type of inspection. Although I will say that I've been meeting with a few different individuals now who are working on that type of operation. So what happens in that commercial kitchen situation is that um, whoever basically owns the kitchen is responsible for all the HACCP and the work that's done by the other producers. So there would be an establishment number assigned to that kitchen and those individuals would actually have to be um, you know, in contact with the people. They could allow the people to come in and do their own work, but the owners of the kitchen would be responsible for making sure that each producer meets the HACCP requirements of each plan for whatever process they're doing. And um, yeah, see, and I said, so is there a published list of slaughterhouses in Vermont? And there actually is on the um, meat inspection site at VermontAgriculture.com. Um, it's I think it says list of processing facilities, slaughter and processing facilities in Vermont. And you can click on that link, and that will give you all of the ones. I think they're separated by county, and uh, you find out where they are. All right. Speaking of links, um, I am going to post a link here to a quick survey that if um, uh, you guys have a chance to follow that link um, and just give us feedback on this webinar, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and it looks like there's one last question here. Um, uh, this can happen en route to the I think in an RTE kitchen. So RTE generally refers to ready to eat. Um, so butchering, and, and I'm assuming that she's just talking about the cutting up of the animal, not not the actual slaughtering. But cutting up can happen in an RTE kitchen um, if the kitchen is set up um, with a HACCP plan to do it either separation by time or space. Um, as you know, once you have a ready to eat product, um, that product has usually gone through some sort of a lethality step. In other words, it's been cooked to a temperature that makes sure there's no pathogens that um, can be in that product. So when you have that, if that product goes through a lethality step, um, it's actually more susceptible to contamination from other products. So and in a raw state, you have to have to have some separation between that operation and, and the ready to eat products. Again, that can be by time or space, and, and then the plant um, has a plan or sanitation plan will show how they actually separate that and take care of the contamination issues or the cross contamination issues. And uh, who pays the custom slaughterer if you deliver the animal? Um, could that be incorporated into the cost of the live animal or? Um, does the person have to pay the custom slaughter directly the customer? Um, generally, it is the um, the individual who owns the animal that would pay for um, that process. Um, you know, the person who sells the live animal can you know charge a delivery fee, um, that sort of thing. But generally, the um, if it's sold as a live animal, then that person who owns the animal takes care of those fees. All right, well, we are 
uh, two minutes away from ending here. I want to thank you, Randy, very much. This was super informative. And I want to let everyone know that on the New Farmer website uh, where you uh, linked into the webinar, if you came in through that way, we are posting a PDF of this presentation. Um, we also have two uh, fact sheets um, that were put together. Uh, one looks at um, species and markets and what the um, inspection requirements are for slaughtering of animals. Another one uh, goes over a lot of this labeling information. So if you're looking for some more information, um, they're on our website. And I'll post that here. Also, if you put your email address uh, into the chat box, um, we will uh, capture that and send you a link to where this information can be found as well, um, as well as the links that are in Randy's presentation here. Um, so I'll just put our New Farmer website um, up in the chat box here so you can grab that if you want. Um, if you don't like to put your email address out to everybody, um, in the below the chat box you'll see it says send, and you can just send it to the moderator. Um, and that will get your email address just to me. So um, thank you very much, Randy. It was great to have you with us um, this afternoon. And yep. uh, we really appreciate it. Sure, my pleasure. And again, as always, if there's questions, uh, give us a call and we'll go from there. All right. Have a good afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thanks. You as well. The host has left the meeting. So at this time, the meeting will come to an end. Thank you, and goodbye.